Uh, hello, everyone. It's nice to see so many faces. Um, I'm Josh. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about blocks and also Grand Central Dispatch, which is uh, two of my favorite things uh, to come along recently in macOS and now iOS. So um, you notice that the real headline is not Lego. Um, I'll tell you a bit about this. Um, on Boing Boing, this picture appeared. It's um, a Babbage difference engine implemented with Lego. I, found, I find these sorts of things incredibly entertaining. Um, just look at the detail on that. I, I can't imagine how many Technic Lego sets you could actually need to build that sort of thing. Um, not to mention all the regular bits and pieces of you know, Lego with holes in it. Um, they've got gears and chains. and I think these things are custom, though. Little things that have the numbers on them that, give, that you can do the readout on. Yeah. Um, I thought this was applicable because um, I'll get into later how blocks um, simplify um, your code by letting you do specific things. And you know, most of these pieces are sort of general and you can use them, but there's specific ones that you just need in that particular spot. And that's um, where the analogy comes in. We feel like we're assembling a toy. Um, I don't mean the sort of twisted toys, kind of toys that you might f find in various people's bedrooms. I mean, like, kids' <laughs> toys. Um, and the, the key word is actually assembling. <laughs> right. So we're given um, a bunch of pieces, you know, classes, protocols, methods, um, delegates, callback functions, all sorts of bits and pieces we want to assemble our code with. And um, it often it's a bit, bit of a jumble, but we, we sort it out because we're coders. Um, and that's great, you know, we can get by 95% 90, of the stuff we do, we just, you know, slap some of this stuff together and, and we call it a, an app. Um, sometimes, though, we don't have a piece that we need. So what do we do? Well, we kind of, well, we, we need, it, say, a piece for a simple job. Um, maybe just, um, you know, gluing, a, a, getting some data out of one field and popping it into another one and just doing it for an entire array or something. Or maybe it's a very particular job, um, in which case it, it just needs to it just needs to do its particular thing, and then you know you carry on. Um, so so what do we do? We, we we take pieces that we have and we try and jam enough of them in to to, to fill the spot. Um, hopefully this will all become clear in just a minute. The, the pieces we have sometimes don't fit, and sometimes we have to make an entire factory. Um, just to produce one piece. It's kind of the Batman effect. He's got to order 10,000 bat masks <laughs> to fill his quota, but you know, he only needs one. So um, just to give you a couple of examples, performing code on a different thread. How do we do this? Well, in Coco, we use perform selector on main thread. And this is nice. We can um, pass any selector and give it any parameter we want and do this on any object, and it'll, it'll work. Um, the problem with this is that our, our selector has to be implemented as a method. The method implementation is going to appear somewhere else. It's not right next to where we're invoking it. It's somewhere else. Um, related issue, callbacks. Sometimes we have some long operation. It call, lets us know when it's done. So we have this like, you know, callback. Again, we have a selector. We have to implement the, the method somewhere. And so, and, and, and so it doesn't appear, it doesn't appear part of the logical flow of the program. Um, another thing, delegates, right? This is, this is a really neat and uh, fun piece of, of pattern that um, Apple has given us. We, 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 we take an, an object and we assign it to the delegate property of something, and the delegate, or us rather, gets notified when various things happen. Um, and this is great, you know? Suppose we have our foo class and it, and it has a, uh, a delegate property, so this, this method we, we implement, we find out when this foo gets a bar for an index path, what, whatever that means. And this is great. So we've got one foo. We just process the index path. That's really easy. Suppose we had another one. Well, then we've got to test for the first one. And then we've got to make, and in any other case, we've got to make sure it's the other one. And we do the different processing for whichever one we've, we've been called. And this gets really complicated when you add more than two. And this actually gets really dumb. So. <laughs> We need a better way of doing this. Um, related to this, notifications, key value observing, same problem. So not only does we have to, say, for example, observe a single object, but we might be observing multiple keys on that object. So we've got a massive if block, which is split out into however many keys and objects we're um, observing. 
and you know, it just becomes really unwieldy. So blocks to the rescue. It's going to wear my pirate hat, but um, I forgot it. So blocks help solve the problem of once off custom code in that we can, um, we can, we can write it. It can appear, you know, we, we don't have to use it more than once, but it can be reused. Um, um, they solve the problem of having related code close together. Um, so I'll, I'll show you some examples of this. And finally, um, they're not just like inline functions or that. They actually capture some state that we can use, and they just do this automatically. It's really great. So <coughs> you might have heard a few things about blocks, um, that they were introduced in Snow Leopard and iOS 4. And this is true. You can um, compile your code with blocks, um, that you, right, your code uses blocks, and you compile it with the iOS 4 SDK and on the Snow Leopard um, build system. But I've got excellent news for you. Code that you've compiled with blocks can actually run on earlier systems. For instance, if I made a, a simple program which had a, you know, a block, I can compile it on the iOS 4 SDK and run it on my iOS 3, iPhone 3G. It'll work. This is because it's just a compiler trick. What's actually going on is it pulls out the code, makes uh, a function, and then it pulls out the state, and it bundles it together nicely. And it's all just in memory and really neat. It's not actually a, an API thing where, well, this is where the in incompatibility comes from. If you try and use a block-based API, um, they aren't available in the earlier systems. They're only available on Snow Leopard and iOS 4. So, um, I'll come up to some examples of these APIs that you can't use um, if you're try trying to take an earlier system. But the, the good news is you can write your own functions and stuff that take blocks, and they'll work on the early systems. So how do blocks work? Well, let's first find out how to write them. A block variable and a block type are just like function pointers, only you use a caret instead of an asterisk. What do I mean? Well, our first one here is a function pointer. It takes a C string and returns an int. Our block, which is pretty much exactly the same, just as a caret where the asterisk was. Um, the, the, here's some examples. Um, so there, there's a block variable that's declared to you know, do the, what we just said. And uh, the other one at the bottom um, simply takes no parameters and returns nothing. So it's just, that would be representing, say, some action that we just want to do. We don't really want to ask the block for any information back. So benefit number one of blocks is that unlike function pointers, which require you to define the function somewhere else, not all the time. You can, you can cast integers, random integers to function pointers and call them. Um, I wouldn't recommend that. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, generally, you, know, you, you have to define what you're going to do, and then you assign it to a function pointer. Um, where, where you're defining it is probably somewhere else. Unlike that, blocks are defined right now. They're inline. You use a block literal to define them, and it works like this. So suppose we have our block variable there, defined as something that takes no parameters and returns nothing. Then we can um, give it a value like that. Dead simple. We have the caret, um, a list of parameters it takes in parentheses, and then the curly brackets where the code goes. Really simple. And if we don't take any parameters, we can just leave the brackets right out. Simple. The, here's, an, here's another example. Here's, this one takes an NS array as a parameter. And we're returning uh, an integer. We don't actually say what the return type is on the block literal. That's part of the type of the variable we assign it to. It's it just something you don't have to worry about. So obviously, invoking blocks is a rather a lot like invoking function pointers. You just use the brackets. You call it like a, a function. Here's some examples. Benefit number two of blocks comes from the fact that they are lexical closures. What this means is um, you don't have to pass in the all the val values it needs as parameters. Here's an example. So we've got, say, a variable life, which is conveniently defined as 42. And we're going to use that value in a block. It's right next to where the block is defined, so we can use it. The block will copy the value of that variable into its own little struct. And when the block actually, actually gets executed, that, that, that'll actually print the value that it captured. So um, that makes them really easy to use. You don't have to pass in half the things you'd normally need to. Um, there is a, 
a lot of detail here, and I'll get into some of this. Um, the first thing is you can't write to a captured variable unless you declare the variable with double underscore block. Um, so for example, if we've got our life variable again, if we declare it with double underscore block, then we can write to it in a block that's declared in the same scope. This is to stop us doing stupid things, um, and it's also to give the compiler a hint of where it's supposed to put different things into memory. Um, now, the really neat thing about blocks is that they're actually Objective-C objects as well. In C and C++, you can use them, and um, they b behave pretty much as expected, but in Objective-C, they inherit from NS objects. They have sensible definitions for all the methods that, that suppose NS object takes. So what you usually find is that they're um, very easy to, um, to interact with your Cocoa code. They're full objects. So just to sh um, flesh this out a bit, um, we've got a block. Let's say it's just one of these really simple ones. We can copy it. We can retain it and release it. We can even auto-release it. It's really simple. And if we don't have Coco or Objective-C at hand, say we're just writing a plain old C program or a C++ program, then we can use uh, another couple of um, functions that we've got um, access to, block copy and block release. They pretty much do what you think they do. <laughs> now, I need to talk to you a bit about how blocks um, start, the, the life cycle of a block, because um, this has bitten me several times. Um, and it's very important that you understand this. It's very, very important. So it's so important I put it in red. Okay, so blocks start life. Oh, sorry, uh, here's, here's the two main areas of program memory that you have access to, the stack and the heap. The stack is where you put all your temporary variables and stuff while you're executing the heaps for all those long-lived objects that you just sort of, you create with alloc in it and so on. So blocks start off on the stack, just like, you know, other literals, like C strings and numbers and so on. And we can, you know, there's, I'm going to use the symbol for a block. Um, we can add another one. As soon as our stack frame dies, the blocks are going to go away. So if we want to return a block, we have to do this. We have to copy it. it and this copy operation moves it onto the heap. From there, we can retain and release it and do, so on, and it will all make sense. But on the stack, it doesn't do anything because... Um, it's going to die anyway. So once it's on the heap, we can return it. The ones on the stack go away. So some patterns to use um, with blocks. You would normally retain an object, use it, and then release it. But for a block, you want to copy it first. And if you um, so yeah, so retain me, use me, release me. And then if you're... Um, if you're returning a, a block or a, any other of C, objects of C objects, you'd be retaining and then auto-releasing. So that way, um, it'll go away if the, the calling code doesn't need it. So just to reiterate this point, because it's very important, if you're returning a block literal, do it like this. Copy, auto-release. Very important. It's also very important when you're passing blocks into things like NSArray. NS array retains its um, objects that you pass into it, which is very cool. Um, it's part of what makes it neat. Um, but because it retains, it doesn't actually copy, it just retains. It's the, the two are not the same. So for blocks, we have to copy it first. So when you're creating an array of blocks, do it like this. Or alternatively, you could um, simply have them all predefined in variables somewhere, add them to the array after they've been copied, and then release them. But you know, this, this makes short logical sense, so I wouldn't do it any other way. Right, so what am I going to do now? Ah, yeah. Now, here's where the magic really starts. I, I said that black blocks capture the scope. They capture things like you know, ints and char pointers and so on. But they also capture Objective-C objects. And um, the really neat thing is, there's a lot that's taken care of for you. So suppose we've got an object sitting in memory, any old Objective-C object, and we've got a block. And our block uses this object, like so. It tells the, the object that's going to do something to it. Well, guess what? You don't have to retain the object. The compiler will do it. It's magic, 
absolute gypsy magic. The compiler will release it for you. When it does this, is at when the, the block comes into existence, it retains, and when the, the block gets released, it will do its release and release all the objects it refers to. So the neat thing is when the block dies, it gets released, and if that, you know, the retain count goes to zero, then that will be released and it's all good. This doesn't happen if your object was double underscore block. Why? Well, double underscore block means I'm going to modify this variable, which in this case means I'm going to modify a pointer to that object. So because you could be changing the object that it's pointing to, it gets a bit complicated and the compiler doesn't know what to do, so it just gives up. It just says, I'm not going to retain or release for you. And this is um, very handy. So supposing our object dies, um, then we have to make sure that we've retained it. We can't just call it <laughs> when the object's not there. Yeah. DIY. I, I tell you all this just because it's bitten me before, and um, I don't want you guys to walk away from this going, he told me to use blocks and they're wonderful, but they're so, I can't get them to work. They're really simple. You just have to, you know, keep this in mind. <laughs> okay, so some more about uh, blocks in Objective C. Wouldn't it be nice if we could, you know, keep them in, pass them into our uh, methods and um, have properties which have block types? Well, it's really simple. Um, we have the block type there inside the parentheses. We notice we take the name of the block out and stick it um, out in front. Uh, sorry, the the end. And then for a property. The only thing that you really have to remember is use copy, don't use retain. It's simple. So now I'm going to talk about doing everything using what we've just learnt. Um, and here we start with the, the new stuff. So, okay, so in 10.6 and iOS 4.0, they added something to NSArray called enumerate block, sorry, enumerate objects using block. And the idea is you give this thing a block and it calls the block for each object. It's actually really simple. It gives you the object that it's calling, that, 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 that it's up to, the index of the object, and it gives you a chance to stop the enumeration process using that bool pointer. Um, and the neat thing about this is um, this one um, will just go sequentially, one after the other, in serial. So what you can do is, if you want it to say go in reverse, or maybe you want it to do it all concurrently, they added another one called Enumerate objects with options using block. And the options are NS enumeration concurrent, which obviously processes all the blocks at once, or as much as it can at once, and NS enumeration reverse, which does it sequentially but backwards. Um, another useful thing they added to NS array is indexes of objects passing test. This is um, very convenient. So for, if you want to find just all the objects, sorry, the indexes of all the objects satisfying some predicate, that's the one you go to. Um, it also has an options variant, so it can process the whole array concurrently or in reverse if that's your thing. Um, and there's another one. You can sort the array using a block. Um, in this case, our block has been given a name, uh, sorry, our block type has been given a name, and it's comparator, um, which is defined as a block, which just takes two objects and returns a comparison result. Comparison result being ordered, ascending, descending, all the same. Um, so yeah, that's um, primary application of blocks, um, and they're incredibly handy to know for that reason. Um, another thing that you would probably be interested in, this is sort of bordering on functional programming. It's not there at all. So some guys took blocks and thought, hey, you know what, I think we'll make some functional programming um, extension sort of features for Objective-C. So they did, it's called Functional Kit, you can find it on GitHub, or just Google for it. Um, so now I've got something for phone developers. Um, the old way of doing animations is like this. You say UI view begin animations, blah. You set a bunch of properties on the animation. Then you change the properties you want to change and then you commit the animations, which is great. As long as you remember to call commit animations. Because if you don't, it's not actually going to animate anything. So what they came up with was a version of this which lets you yeah, you know, it, it's kind of blow up. So they came up with a version of this which um, takes a block instead. And the neat thing about this is the compiler will match the curly braces and you won't ever forget to commit. 
And the next way that um, block to make your life easier is for key value observing. Now, normally you have to implement this beast every time you observe the, um, say, a property on an object. Well, some guys saw this and they thought, well, this is nice and all, but all the notifications for our observations are being passed through this one method. And we get this massive if statement, you know, if object is this and key is that, then we're changing this. So some, so two separate projects exist for making this work with blocks. I'll tell you about them now. There's the KVO blocks project at toxicsoftware.com and there's also one on Andy Matuszczak's blog, um, which basically does the same thing. And they're really cool. I strongly suggest you use these. Right. Next up, I want to tell you about delegates. Now, I spoke about delegates before, and, and they also have the same if block problem. So um, what we can do is a bit of DIY, but it, it works out. It'll save you time in the end. So what we can do is we can implement our delegate once. Say we want to have a delegate on our food class. Well, we might call this food block delegate. And we're going to have a property on it, which is just the block we're going to call when the delegate method gets called. And, and you know, fooded bar or whatever it's called. Um, now our implementation kind of looks like this. We've got our, our method that implements the delegate protocol. And that just passes the execution off to the block. I'm testing for, for nil here just because sometimes I forget and if I forget to actually set this property with a, a block or something then if I don't test, then it'll, it'll crash. So you've got to test. It doesn't cost you much to test. And then when we want to actually use it, we might as well create a new delegate. We can create as many dele different delegates as we want. Um, and then pass it a block, um, giving our implementation for this specific delegate. We don't have to have a massive if block now. And then we tell our, our get it to do the work. And eventually, do work will call the delegate method. The delegate method will call the block. The block will do its thing. It's really simple. But there is a problem. The problem is delegates don't, delegate properties don't retain the object you pass into it. So yeah, everything, everything from like NS XML parser, UI table view, what have you, the delegate is assumed by the class to exist the whole time not the other way around. It's not the, the, the table view owning the delegate. It's, yeah. So what you have to do is take memory management into your own hands, um, and you do that with the whole double underscore block thing. So you declare your delegate with double underscore block, and notice in this case, I'm not auto-releasing the delegate. I'm just leaving it retained. Then when the block is finished, and I'm assuming that this is the last block the foo is ever going to call, I release the delegate. And that's how that works. Um, notice that if we had left the block out, um, then we might have been able to simply get, a, get away with not having a delegate release. But we would have had to refer to delegate inside the block, otherwise it wouldn't have auto-retained. It's just easier with the whole ma manual management. And this is just... So this um, whole block delegate pattern um, sort of got me thinking about another possible use. So the, the whole thing with the, the properties with the value of having, having a block type, a property with a block type is that you can change what the property does. You can change the block. So why not instead of, say, using the Objective-C runtime methods to change the implementation of a method at runtime, just have um, a method which calls off to a block property. And this is pretty simple. You know, you set the block, and that's the implementation. OK, so if you want to learn more about blocks, and I strongly suggest you do, because they will make your life easy, um, you check out Apple's own documentation on it. Just go to Xcode developer documentation. Block programming topics. The Clang documentation, um, Clang being the first compiler front ends to implement blocks. Um, you can also check out this. Um, sorry, what the hell happened there? Just give me a minute. 
Okay, yep. Clang. Um, this is a very informative website. It, they, the guy who did this basically experimented with blocks until he found out precisely what they did. And it's very, very enlightening. And finally, um, InformIT interviewed um, the guys from Big Nerd Ranch, and there's a few interesting tidbits there as well. So, now, um, that's all well and good, but you're probably also interested in making a code parallel. So I thought I'd talk about Grand Central Dispatch. Um, and it's worth pointing out that it's only available in 10.6 and iOS 4. So, the way you use Grand Central Dispatch um, is pretty basic. There's, there's two main ways. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about the C way of doing it, because that's what I'm used to. But there's a Cocoa way of doing it, which you should all use if you're Cocoa developers. Um, so the C, C++-ish way would be to include the dispatch header. And this gives you access to all manner of goodness. So um, first, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about why you'd want to use GCD. Um, the first reason is, um, who actually likes pthreads? <laughs> They're a bit clunky, don't you think? Um, it's a system-wide approach. Apple are using Grand Central Dispatch everywhere. It's in mail, it's in preview, it's in screen sharing. Um, just they use it um, as a system-wide approach. So it manages how many threads it needs to do everything. Um, yes, it, 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 it keeps the right number of idle threads running at a given time and warms them up for you. And it does, it's yeah, magic. It's just gyp gypsy magic. Just use it. <laughs> And um, if you use their queues, um, it's pretty easy, straightforward. It's obviously, obviously not going to solve all your synchronization and deadlock issues, but it's kind of a big step, so having a, having a model. So what's a queue? Well, a queue in, in Grand Central Dispatch is of type dispatch queue T. And there are two main types, concurrent queues and serial queues. What happens with a concurrent queue is that all the blocks that you give the concurrent queue, it executes concurrently as much as it can. And serial queue, it just executes them once at a time. And there are two queues that you can use straight away in any program. They are the global queue, which is concurrent, and the main queue, which is serial. The main queue corresponds to your app's main thread. So if you want to, say, do UI updates, just push blocks onto the main queue. And that's a fairly that's a legitimate way of doing it. So how do you get these queues? Well, um, you use one of these. The first one gives you the global queue. Don't worry about the zeros. They're just unnecessary parameters at this point. You can get the main queue, which is, takes nothing. So it's no, nothing to quibble about there. It's got current queue, which you call from a block which is running from a queue to find out what queue it's running from. So. If your block once, say, wanted to do UI updates if it was running on the main thread, but not do UI updates if it was running on another, th another thread, then, then you could sort of compare that to, say, get main queue. Um, and finally, you can create your own queues. It takes a C string as a label, and the other parameter, don't worry about, just pass null. So just to sort of flesh out what I mean, um, the global concurrent queue, all the blocks flow along it. Um, and they just run. You just push work onto it, and it happens in the background. So you don't have to think about it. Um, other queues that you create um, go basically in, you know, uh, once at a time. Um, and all the queues that you create will be concurrent with respect to one another, but blocks in the queue will be serial with respect to one another. So that's, that's just really simple, really st stupidly simple. So how do you get work onto a queue? You call dispatch async. It takes the queue and the block you want to pass onto it. Block here is just one of those simple take nothing, return nothing blocks, which they've given the name dispatch block T. Dispatch apply is another one. This is really handy to know. Um, it will basically, it's like a parallel for loop. So basically, you give it how many times you want the block to be pushed on to the queue. And the block will receive as a one of its parameters, or rather the first parameter, the first and only parameter, um, the index of where it is, of, of which instance it is. So um, 
it's a really straightforward um, application. You could use this to re replace all your for loops if they were if they were safe for the whole multi-threading thing. Um, the thing to remember with dispatch apply is it will wait until the last block is finished that it pushed on. Um, dispatch async will return immediately, but dispatch apply won't. It will wait until the last one is finished. Um, another one which is kind of like dispatch async is dispatch after. It tells you that you, you use this one when you want to have a block run after a specific amount of time. And I'm, I'm really not sure why you would want to pass um, the current time in, because it's just going to be a less efficient way of calling dispatch async. But um, you can. Um, and yes, yeah, I guess it's handy if you want to defer your execution. Um, and then we have groups. Groups are good for keeping a, a leash on your blocks. You want to know when a particular group of work is going to finish. So you use dispatch groups to handle them. Um, the first thing to, to know is that there's a type and obviously a create function. Creates a new group. Then you can push blocks onto a queue and give, make sure they're part of the group using dispatch group async. And then when you want to wait on your group of blocks, you could just call dispatch group wait. There's a timeout on that. You probably want dispatch time forever. Um, sometimes you obviously don't. It'd be very annoying if you waited forever and your blocks weren't ever going to return. So you can provide a different time value if you so want. But I've only ever used dispatch time forever because all my blocks return, because I'm a smart programmer. And that's how that works. And um, yeah, so there's an alternative, though, to waiting. And um, this is actually pretty cool, is that instead of waiting um, for a group to finish, you can just be notified. You can have a block run when the group is finished. This probably solves 99% of your needs. So remember this one. Now, you don't have to use Grand Central Dispatch with blocks. There's, for most of the functions I've talked about just now, there's equivalents that take function pointers instead. Um, and not only do they take function pointers, but they also take a con context pointer in case you need to bundle along any state that you need. So. Um, Time for some examples. Um, my first example will be calculating cubes. It's pretty simple. All it does is use dispatch apply instead of a for loop. You can easily see how that could be replaced with a for loop and would then work serially instead of concurrently. Um, here's another example that the concurrency nerds among you may find amusing is, dis is the Mandelbrot set um, in 10 lines rather than eight. <laughs> The, the two extra lines are just getting the global queue. It's fully parallel. Okay, so now I'd like to have a few words about Coco style Grand Central Dispatch, um, which is just Coco style concurrency, really. Um, it doesn't have to be implemented on Grand Central Dispatch, but that's, they did. And, and because they did, the whole system reaps the benefits. So. Um, here we use things um, that look like this. We have NS operation, which is actually an abstract class. You want to, when you, when you actually want an NS operation, you want to instantiate block operation or invocation operation. Block operation takes a list of blocks to execute, and it may execute them concurrently when the operation is run. The invocation operation takes a selector and an object. So, so if you want to do stuff old style, use invocation operation. Um, why do you want to use these things? Well, you want to use them because of the way NS operation queue works. And it kind of goes like this. Each operation has a list of dependencies. So you can have any arbitrary sort of dependency graph among your operations. And when the most dependent on operations are finished, the next ones will be executed by the operation queue. It's really straightforward. And you, you go and add and remove dependencies for a particular operation, you add and remove dependency. So in this instance here, our operation queue will first execute those guys, and then those two, and then maybe that one. It'll do them concurrently with respect to one another.
the neat thing is um, also that operation queues are, you can have multiple of them, so you can keep them concurrent with respect to one another. And if you want serial operation in a single queue, you just have a single row of dependencies set up. So it's quite flexible. Um, some things to remember, though, are operations can only be in one operation queue at once. You can't ever have it in more than one. And the other thing is you can't have dependencies on an operation in another queue. It's, all the dependencies have to be in one queue. So uh, for more on that, I strongly suggest you check out the Apple concurrency programming guide and also their Grand Central Dispatch reference. And I, that's the end of my talk. So um, I guess either I'll di dive into some demos. Do I have much time? Oh, yeah, I've got a few minutes. Or we can take questions. Who's up for demos? All yeah, right. Let's see what I can pull off. So turn off screen mirroring or something. No, I'll leave it that way. OK, so let's fire up Xcode. And this is why you don't use the developer preview, because it crashes. Um, oh, God. OK. Let's use this one. So I'm going to open a file. I'm not going to open the stuff folder. I'm going to open the code folder. I'm going to show you that um, Manda brought demo before. So where are we? OK, so this is the same example. It's actually exactly the same. I've just copied and pasted it. And I'm going to demonstrate the difference between um, the main and the global queue. So well, actually, not the main queue. In this case, we're just creating a queue. But all the queues we, we create are, in fact, serial. There's, the, the, dichot the dichotomy I showed you before is really pretty shallow. You, you only get the choice of making serial queues. So, so oh, yeah, um, sure. How do you do that? Uh, Apple Plus. Oops. Yeah, I'll go to Xcode preferences instead. It seems a lot better. So, text editing. Next one, fonts and colors. Thank you. <laughs> Very smart audience. I like you guys. Um, oh, Jesus. Oh, Pete's sake. Presentation mode? Where's that one? Presentation. OK. Cool. Is that, is that good for everyone? OK, so all the, all the math in the middle you can ignore. Um, so we're just using dispatch apply instead of a for loop. It computes for each um, of the width by height um, array points we give it, um, what the, whether it's in or out of the Mandelbrot set. And it's, it's an embarrassingly parallel problem, but you can, if you had a less parallelizable problem, you can just use multiple queues to organize your dependencies. Um, and so, th so this method is good for this C stuff, this low-level stuff. If you were using like Cocoa and stuff, use NS operations much better. But um, yeah, so okay, so this will create a serial queue and just push all the blocks on. So it's no better than doing a for loop. And to show you um, how well it works, I'll just go to code and GCC the Mandelbrot. and show you. So this takes a bit of time. In fact, I'll close it and time it for you. This takes a bit of time, and then it'll print out an ASCII Mandelbrot for you, for us. It should take about 12 seconds. And that's pretty equivalent timing. Yeah. Um, you notice that activity monitor here is showing that we've only used one CPU. Um, yeah, so there we go. Uh, it's obviously a bit bigger than the um, terminal screen of, of size of two. Okay, so 23 seconds of real time. 
If, on the other hand, we just swap it out for uh, the global queue, that's all. Save. And run it again, it should take roughly half the time. Let's see. Yep, so 14 seconds. It's pretty good, I, li I quite like that. <laughs> and down in the activity model before the, the history disappears, it's used both the CPU cores 100% the whole time while it was executing, so pretty good. It's a bit faster when I tried it at home. Um, I think that's mostly because QuickTime wasn't doing screen recording and it's a bit of a resource hog. Um, cool, uh, what else can I show you? Well, a while ago, I wrote another Mandelbrot generator that used, um, actually, I'll go to Apple's example here. We've got, uh, it's called Dispatch Fractal. I wonder if it still works. Oh, no, not that one. I swear I didn't use a Mac. Okay. Cool. So this is um, doing the render for getting the values of all the points on the, the dispatch queues, but it's doing the color cycle on OpenCL. Uh, obviously, those of you who are interested would have gone to um, Derek's talk about OpenCL. Um, I might show you some of the code. It's a bit horrible, though. Um, so I think it's DF Fractals here has got... Yeah, it's, here's the definition for the Mandelbrot, obviously, is straightforward complex number arithmetic, um, and a variety of other fractals you can compute. And then we've got this um, fractal compute um, array. This just sets the computation up. And then when we actually want to compute, um, what does it do? Well, these are actually all blocks, so it just fires off the block at the appropriate index of the array. This is an example of ma blocks making your life a lot easier and also the fact that they can interrupt with Grand Central Dispatch. So if I close that one. Okay. And yeah. Hmm. I don't know if there's much more to show there. Um, I'll fire up the example that I wrote a couple of years ago. Um, where did I put it? And this one? Yeah, here we go. Um, so I had a bunch of um, open sales stuff, but there's also, hopefully, I've left the code in. Uh, no, it does the OpenGL stuff. Where is it? Compute. Right. So this class goes off and computes. And what it's going to do... Where is the engine? Yeah, here we go. So... <coughs> uh, yep, blocks. Okay. So here's my... Um, Grand Central Dispatch um, implementation here. Um, I keep track of how many blocks are running and how many I've queued, but you don't have to do it this way. There's actually functions that let you um, find out how many blocks are running. Uh, you just have to ask Grand Central Dispatch. I didn't actually know about those functions at the time I wrote this. Um, so yeah, I put the blocks onto the global queue. Um, in, this, in this instance, I'm not testing every point on a single block. I'm actually testing a chunk of points per block. Um, bit of debug output there. And then instead of using dispatch apply, what I've actually done is use dispatch async and push them on in a for loop. Sometimes you might find this is more effective. Um, in this case, I was just, this was being run from the UI, so I just wanted to return as quickly as possible. Dispatch applies your, sorry, dispatch async is your friend there. 
Um, yeah, and the rest is pretty simple. So it does um, copies some data around and then does some com computation and does some anti-aliasing and yeah. Quite fun to watch, I guess. Um, so now, what did I set this one to? I think this was currently set to the grand set, sorry, the OpenCL one, which is, yeah, actually did a stupid amount of point tests there in a, not, a lot of, not a lot of time. Um, but if I switch over to Grand Central, where did I put this constant? This is why um, I don't like demoing some of my code because I don't can't find my way around it again. Um, uh, yeah. Oh well, you get the idea. So close that one off. Um, yeah, I'd, so I guess, um, I guess I'm out of examples. Do you have any questions? Could I see a simple example of a block being executed in Objective-C? Ah, block in Objective-C? Just, just declare a block and then make it run. <coughs> sure. Let's um, make a new, just for fun, I'll make it an iOS application, view-based. So let's say we've got, I don't know, we'll, we'll put a um, label on our nib or something. Um, so there we go. So over here I'll just um, reference it. Better make it an outlet, didn't I? Better synthesize it. And then back over in this beast, I'd better point to it. Um, no, it's not going to help. Right, so I'm going to execute a block in view did load. Um, so I've got to give it um, store it somewhere. So I'm going to say void blah equals that, that sort of guy, and then I'm going to do something like self dot label dot text equals word. I come up with such incredible examples, don't you think? So if I run this, um, the view should appear in the iPhone simulator and the label should have the value word. Uh, actually, no, it shouldn't because we didn't execute the block. Thank you for pointing that out. So we want to actually execute it. Um, blah. Oh, no, you don't have to. You can just run it. Yeah, ta-da. It has run the block. Now we want to run the block, say, somewhere else. Um, and this should probably demonstrate why you should not do UI updates on a non-main thread. So if I say um, we want an NS block operation. Put it on an operation queue.
this is quite straining. I really should go to shared screen mode or whatever it is. Um, now, what was it? It was. Um, I can't remember how you start an operation queue now. Must be the heat. Um, all right, this is where the wonderful developer documentation comes in handy. Ah, no, that's right. It runs them straight away. So silly of me. So if I demonstrate block pointer, expect a void. Ah, interesting. Hmm. Funny compiler. All right. Why did that crash? No, it didn't crash. Did it? Let's build and debug. No, oh, it worked that time. OK. Cool. Well, there you go. It, it runs a block from an operation on an operation queue. What more can you expect? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Check out my blog, joshnabray.com. I put a blog post up the other day, which has got my sort of block delegate pattern you might find useful. Um, I didn't prepare a demo for that. It's just stuff I'm using in production code that I can't show you because it's secret. Um, <laughs> Yeah, any other questions? Any any other any other demos you want me to run? Yeah? Um, at the start of the talk you said uh, perform selector on main thread yep. was if you had to have the select somewhere else. Yep. Do you have an example where you can perform a block on that? Can you use that same pattern perform selector on main perform block on main thread? Yeah, um, it's what you would do in that case would be to get the main, say, the main dispatch queue, or in our case, we could say in this operation queue, um, main queue, and then either put the block into an operation and add it to the main, main queue like that, or use dispatch async on the main queue um, would be that the alternative in that case. Um, yeah. And of course, the neat thing is we know what we're doing in the block right next to where we execute the block. Yep. Different priorities on different queues. Can you hear that? Yep. There's uh, priorities set in um, operation queue. Hang on. Um, I think I had it before. If you set up the operation. OK. Well, the, the, the basic. Um, thing you can control is the maximum number of concurrent operations, but you can also, oh god, <laughs> I hate multi-touch sometimes. Um, say on the operation, you can prioritize operations using yeah, set queue priority. Here we go. Let's drag this across a bit. So this um, sets relative um, priorities of operations next to one another in a queue. It's pretty straightforward. <laughs> a lot of this stuff is just so simple. <laughs> Don't know why I volunteered to do a talk about it. <laughs> Anything else? All right, I guess you go have fun. Um, yeah. Thank you.